Thank you for listening to the season four finale of the Family Twist podcast. This episode is a full circle representation of what we do. I was really wowed by the parallels of Kendall's story and the story of our guest, author Kate Brody. Kate was told on her father's deathbed that she had a secret brother that was just a little older than her. Years later, her brother Ryan found her and what happens next inspired Kate's first novel, Rabbit Hole. Kendall takes over hosting duties this episode as I had a nasty cold and no voice for a couple of weeks. As you can hear, it's still lingering. But hey, the show must go on. Welcome to the show, Kate. Thank you so much for having me. I just mentioned off the air that Corey and I already bought a copy of your new book, and we can't wait to receive it. Honestly, even if we had received it, I think I like to go into some of these conversations blind so that, you know, I don't have preconceived notions about what you might say. So I think the timing is is great. Well, thank you for ordering. Um, I hope I hope you enjoy. Well, I can tell from what I read about it that I'm going to be intrigued. So is there a connection between your personal story of finding your long lost brother and the content in the book, which of course is fiction? There is. The book revolves around this family that um, was at the center of a lot of media scrutiny because their daughter went missing 10 years prior. So the family structure is like loosely modeled on my family. I have sisters who I lived with as a child, not anymore. My dad had a son who was older than me, not by much, like about a year and a half. So Teddy, who's the main character of Rabbit Hole, has a similar structure. She has this half brother, her father's son from a previous marriage. And he has been kind of abandoned really by her father who has instead started this new family and kind of tried to restart his life. So that was similar, I think, to to our structure. Although in my case, it wasn't my dad's son from a previous marriage. It was um, really less substantial, the relationship than that. Right, right. And and that sounds very purposeful, like you, you know, wanted that, right? I mean, it didn't just happen. You you wrote it that way. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm interested in exploring some of these family dynamics. They're so common. I mean, when I published that piece in The Guardian, I heard from so many people who were either in my position of finding out they had a sibling they didn't know about, or they were the parent or they were the the sibling, the one who was kind of on the outside of the family. And that was also really illuminating hearing from all these people, because I think a lot of us live with that as like a family shame. But it is really such a, I mean, life is messy, and people have these situations. um, And they're they're so much more common than you realize. I mean, I even heard from friends, so I had no idea. They were like, oh, yeah, I have have something similar like this. Um, So it's kind of this open secret in a way. And I think that was something I wanted to explore in the book. And also I wrote in the essay, it felt like an apology in a way, like a way of fiction is a way sometimes of rewriting history. So it was a bit, a way of kind of reaching out or changing the narrative. Hmm. Have you heard from your long lost brother and or your sisters about, about how they feel about the book? My sisters had read early versions of the book, so they're not surprised by any of it. I don't think my brother has read it yet. I don't get the sense he's a big fiction reader, but I assume mm-hmm. he will at some point. He obviously read the Guardian piece because I you know, told him, you have full veto power over this. Um, and he was very pleased by it, I think, very like moved by it. I think so much of the problem for him has been feeling like, we were trying to write him out of the family, you know, like there was just Mm -hmm. no acknowledgement of Mm -hmm. his life and his presence. So uh, it was a corrective in a way. I was nervous about it, but I, Mm -hmm. he was very gracious, very generous. Good. I'm so glad that's been the outcome for you. And it's so funny just when I read and Corey and I read the uh, guardian article, I, I immediately turned to Corey and I was like, so I already feel so connected to Kate's brother because I'm the one, you know, that was found, you know, and uh, my story's, you know, different in that neither side of the family knew. Well, I mean, they knew about me, but I'm saying knew where I was Mm -hmm. because I was adopted when I was two months old. 
and um, it was a closed adoption, and I knew nothing till 2017. So part of my story sounds like yours with my mother's family because my mother has never spoken to me, and my one sister and I are very close. The other sister lives physically next door to our mother, which I know makes it awkward, right? Mm -hmm. She can't invite me to her house if she doesn't want our mother, you know, to to be involved. And then my brother is even more standoffish because of our mother. And uh, so it's, and it's the complete opposite on my father's side. Those three kids knew about me. So my father has three other kids and my mother has three other kids. And my dad's family always wanted to find me and, you know, always knew about me, but my mother's did not. So mm. it's been awkward. <laughs> yeah. And it's, I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm struck all the time by how unnecessary a lot of the pain involved in the you know feels in, in these stories i was even i was talking to someone who asked about my kids like well how will you introduce the idea of you know your brother this uncle your kids aren't familiar with and i was like kids are so easy it's like when they yeah. fall if you if you scream and make a big scene about it they start crying but if you're like right. hey you're okay you know hop up they're fine so if you're like hey by the way and you say yep. it like, this is kind of a cool fact. I have a brother who lives in Texas. They just incorporate it so seamlessly. But right. if it becomes this thing, and I think that was the problem too, the way my dad hid it from us for so long, only told me when he was dying, like swore me to secrecy, it became this really loaded thing. And it, it really didn't need to be. There was no reason for it to be such a tense thing. There's another right. world where it was introduced as kind of, a neutral or a, a positive thing. And instead we're still undoing all of that. I think we're still kind of unpacking mm -hmm. all of that. That yep. happens with a lot and of families. It does. And did your mother always know that, that the son was out there? Yeah, she knew. Um, it was very early in their relationship that he found out that this um, other woman was pregnant. And so I think he thought it was going to be a breakup. And then it wasn't the timeline is kind of mind boggling, but yeah, she knew. I mean, I, th I think we still don't see eye to eye on it. She's not like kind of passionate about keeping it a secret, but I think she's gotten to a point where she just thinks it has nothing to do with her, which, you know, fair enough, I guess. But <laughs> so while she doesn't have any desire to meet him or be involved with, she that, said she yeah, would talk to life. him if he was interested. I think my question is always like, how were all of the adults involved not prioritizing the welfare of the child? Because it just feels like so many of the conversations just seem so concerned with the well-being of the adults. And I think mm. when I was a kid, I thought, oh, this will make more sense to me when I get older. And as I've gotten older, it makes even less sense to me. You know, now that I have kids mm -hmm. and I think... I don't know. I, I mean, I try to be as generous as I can with everybody. Everybody was doing their best. And a lot of it is informed by certain like cultural backgrounds and, you know, like a lot of Catholic stuff mixed in there. But it is hard for me to imagine living through a similar situation now and not rallying all of the adults around the all the children right. involved coming from a 2024 lens and I live in LA. So people have all kinds of like very diverse family structures here. And right. there's not a lot of stigma attached to having children in wedlock, out of wedlock, whatever. I try to be mindful of that, but it, it has created this kind of dissonance, I think, where we can't quite come at it from the same perspective because I just don't mm -hmm. get it. I just um, am coming too much from like yep. where I am. And I get it. I get what you mean, because part of what I think is still holding my mother back is that she lives in Southern Louisiana. I don't think there's stigma there, but I think she knows that there was stigma in 1970 when I was born, right. you know, so for her and, and her husband's family doesn't know about me, which is just mind boggling yeah. that I'm 53 years old. When can I stop being the dirty little secret? You right. know what I mean? Like, it just feels weird, especially since my mother has children and grandchildren who've had children out of out of wedlock. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, it just, I, I just can't 
understand, but maybe I never will. Uh, that's okay. To your point, I, I feel like this is a continued journey. It's been six years since I found my family and I feel finally like, I feel like as each day goes, I'm able to give her more grace. I've never had resentment about my birth, my adoption, any of that, because she had no control. She was 15 years old right. and her parents made her give me up. So I couldn't blame, I don't even blame them. Like, you know, it worked out very well for me, but what I resent about her is that it's been six years. You know what I mean? Since we found each other and she's zero contact, nothing. She knows my siblings and I have a connection, but that's it. That's it. So I'm finally getting okay with it. I wasn't. And I hope your brother, you know, is okay with everything, you know? Yeah. I think he had a similar, I mean, when we spoke, he said it's taken him a while to get to a place where he realizes that it wasn't about him. It mm -hmm. wasn't which is, is obvious. It's obvious, right? That seems obvious from the outside. You, it's not like somebody looked and was like, this particular baby is bad. I but do. when you're a kid, everything feels like it's about you, right? Your parents get divorced. That feels like it's because you aren't a good enough kid or something or whatever. And mm -hmm. that is just such a powerful thing. And I think so hard to let go of. And we're wired like that in so many aspects of our like intimate lives, right? With a romantic partner, any kind of rejection, which is usually about them and how they're feeling feels like it's a judgment on you. It's just hard not to internalize that kind of thing. He said it did take him a while to to get to that place where he's like, it, it had to do with whatever everyone else was dealing with and wasn't about me. Do you know what he was told when he was a child about his father? I think he was aware that my dad was alive and out there it's very confusing I guess I still don't have the full picture my mom was under the impression that my dad was seeing him on an annual basis but that was not oh. the case so I don't know mm. if there were different stories being told but Ryan only met him the once that he can remember anyway right around when I was told about him. So right before my dad died, which is also kind of hmm. a mind fuck. Like, oh, here's my dad and yep. now he's dead. So it's like yep. a lot of information at yep. one time. It was interesting talking to him too. I was, I guess, concerned about not wanting to like pour salt in the wounds because it's such a strange thing where I was born so shortly after him and was like an intentional pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Talking to him, I kept thinking it would be easier to say like, yeah, he was a piece of shit dad. Like he was just the worst, yeah. but he wasn't. He was a great dad to us. That has been the hardest part for me is like reconciling in his absence, not being able to talk to him adult to adult. How did the person who, who was this great dad to me, how was he like just dropping the ball in this really serious way? People are complicated. I don't know. And then after it is. they die, yeah. The, the book is, I think, concerned with this question too of like, I think when people are alive, you can hold all of these contradictions a little bit more easily. And then after they die, you really want to pin down like, who is this person? What is the story we tell about them? And that has been hard with my dad because he lived with all these secrets and left all this mess behind. So it's very hard to come up with one monolithic narrative about who he was as a person. And so Teddy, the character in Rabbit Hole, also is grappling with something similar with her dad, where all mm. the posthumous information threatens to kind of overshadow her memories of him. You just drew a parallel to my mother's daughter, Stephanie. She's the one that I'm so close to. And she tells me the same thing that, you know, when I ask her questions about what it was like to grow up in my mother's family, maybe it is guilt. Maybe it's like, oh, I, you know, but it sounds like it was great. And my stepfather's a great guy and, you know, they, they have a wonderful marriage. And I think she, to your point, I think she worries that she's rubbing salt in my wounds. It's funny how with my father's kids, they will say that the way that I grew up sounds like something they would have loved. Mm. You know what I mean? So that's heartwarming yeah. that they kind of 
understand enough about me to embrace my story. And, you know, every one of them has said, oh my gosh, I wish we could have met your parents because my adopted parents have been gone for a long time. These conversations are so interesting to have. And I will say my biological father's ex-wife, who's the mother of my local half-brother and half-sister, I mean, she can't be better to me. She's like sweet. And, you know, we went to her family's Christmas party. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, we feel yeah. like accepted, you know, it's great. It's what I was hoping for, you know, yeah. with, well, with both sides, but I'm getting it from one side. So that's okay. <laughs> and I think it, it is a gift for that side too, right? Like it's such a nicer way to live, to just be like, this is Kendall. He's part of the family. He's coming yep. to our party and not yep. spend all this energy with the shame and the secret keeping and the like, you know, suspicion and keeping people out. There's a lot of things about the culture out here in LA that I don't love and the like kind of like woo woo stuff. But I do think that's something that a lot of people get right is the way that you just come from a position of like, yes, we'll include this person. Yes, your ex-husband's new girlfriend's son is part of the family. Yep. Like just what's the harm in yep. opening your arms to people? I, I think it's so unusual that you get burned by that kind of attitude. Mm -hmm. I do think that defensiveness comes out of some kind of fear, like some kind of tribal fear place, but it just... 99% of the time is just so unnecessary and you'll just end up hurting yourself with that kind of right. position. Yeah. yeah. To your point, this wasn't the first time that we've gone to my ex stepmother's Christmas party, but even the first time we went, when we first moved here, like I walked into the room and these are my half siblings, cousins, mm -hmm. they're no relation to me. And they were like walking up saying, Hey, we have another cousin. And it just made, it just warmed my heart. You know, I'm like, this is crazy and unreal. And it felt surreal, but it was, it was wonderful. And I've always had great relationships with my adoptive parents, you know, the, the cousins on either side of that family, but it was just um, nice to be also you know, included there. It was like, wow. Corey and I always joke and say, you can't have too much family, you know? That's like, true. My adoptive parents died when I was 10 and 16, and I was their only child. So it's not lost on I me mean, almost exactly 30 years later that I made the DNA discovery. And it's like, you know, so I did, I won't say that I felt alone, because like I said, I had cousins and aunts and uncles and things, but you know, it's harder, you know, as, as you're an adult to stay connected to mm -hmm. that extended family. And so just, you know, getting to see my father now and my local brother and sister and their kids. And it's just fantastic. I mean, I went from having zero nieces and nephews overnight to having 13, which was mind blowing as well. And they're just all really good people, you know? That's so sweet. Yeah, I'm so fortunate. And and honestly, I mean, if it weren't for DNA technology, I had tried everything before this. You know, I had been on I'm on every registry that could have ever been, you know, it, that ever existed and I just never found anything and, you know, and my poor brother, the the brother that lives locally, he had been trying to find me for years too, you know, he would random especially, you know, when the internet became a thing. He was like hopping online, trying to find my birth name. But of course there's nothing out there with that. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah, I haven't ever been called Scott White, which is what my birth name was. You know, it's like he had no hope of finding me. So it was amazing. It is incredible the way that technology also, I think, forced a cultural shift because you don't have the option anymore of having a baby and, you know, deciding... I'm just cutting all contact. Yep. Um, it's just not realistic. Like it's, it's not mm -hmm. possible. It changes. I think the way people treat even any kind of like egg or sperm donation, like you have to approach it from a place of openness to some kind of future relationship, because even if that's not your prerogative, it could be your siblings or their kids or your cut, you know, there's just so many entry points 
with DNA. So I think it does at least put an end to that kind of like one-sided rejection of any relationship because it just it's just so unrealistic at this point. Right. Yeah, I remember when I first spoke to my father and my brother warned me when Chris told me that he had submitted his DNA, he's like, my father always worried that I would feel rejected yeah. and feel it so strongly that I would be angry and, you know, that sort of thing. And nothing could be further than that from the truth. But that was a really deep seated fear for him that, you know, when I, if I ever found them that I'd want to, you know, you know, he jokes because I'm the most nonviolent person. He's like, I was worried Kendall would want to kick my ass. I'm like, Hey, that's not who I am. But you know, it was just comical. Dad also at that point in time knew that my dad was only 16 when I was born. So both sets, yeah, both sets of grandparents were against, you know, them trying to keep this baby. Any, it's funny. People will often say to me, well, aren't you angry with your you know, eat both sets of grandparents because they didn't want to keep you. And I'm like, no, I don't, A, who am I to judge? I've never, I've never been a parent and I've definitely never been a grandparent. And I can't imagine, you know, how difficult that is, you know, thinking, oh, well, you know, will we be stuck raising this kid, <laughs> you know, this kid? Um, because the other, that, you know, my dad and mom are so young and I don't judge them about that. You know, if they weren't, feeling it, I wouldn't want to, you know what I mean? Like I wouldn't want to be in that situation and not be treated properly. You know, again, I love my adoptive parents so much that, you know, I always have the nature versus nurture thing going constantly in my mind. And, and I tell you, there's just a lot of, a lot of both Mm -hmm. in my story. You know, I am so my adoptive parents child in so many ways. I mean, it's just shocking, you know? Um, and you know, from politically to, you know, it's, it's things that, um, my upbringing, you know, have, have, have brought to light. So it's fascinating. Well, yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like your sisters are also in contact with your uh, brother. Very lightly, I think, not not to the same extent, um, but mm. um, yeah, I think they we sort of all feel the same way, which is that um, you know we'll we'll follow his lead, and um, I just have been kind of blown away by his graciousness and how thoughtful he's been and reflective and understanding. I think I wasn't worried he was going to kick my ass, but I did kind of think he would be angry with us for participating in this whole, you know, saga to the extent Mm -hmm. that we did as kids. But no, he's really lovely. He said something like, I heard you had a rough couple of years a few years ago, alluding to a different family matter. And he was like, I wish I could have uh, been there to help out, which I thought was so Mm -hmm. lovely and like, you know. It's hard for me to imagine being so generous in his position. But I also see with my own kids, you know, you really can't overestimate the degree to which kids just want to be part of a family, want to be loved, and really are rarely coming at these relationships from a place of anger or resentment. Like you really, it's almost scary how much power you have as a parent with children because their desire to be in communion with you is so strong. I think about him a lot now, just looking at my own kids and thinking about what that experience must have been like for him, kind of Mm -hmm. searching for that connection and just having it fail to return. If he feels like I feel about my biological family, he probably just loves the idea of having three sisters. You know what I mean? Like he just having been raised an only child, always wishing my parents had, you know, had a second child. They weren't biologically going to have children, but I always was like, Oh, you should adopt another kid. And I really, really wanted a sibling. And, you know, I, I kind of got, well, I definitely got one when my father remarried my stepmother, my stepsister moved in with 
us and she and I are exactly the same age. So between seventh grade and 12th grade, you know, it was like having a sibling and she and I get along really great. And uh, she's fantastic. And she's also very excited that I found my biological family. But there is something really cool about having the biological connection. Yeah. There just is. And I never knew how that was going to feel. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. until the day I found my brother on Ancestry, you know, I, it just, it was truly magical just to look at someone and yes, he's only my half brother, but you know, seeing the similarities, you know, Corey laughs because when we are together, when Chris and I are together, Corey will even just like comment, like right after we leave their house, like, oh my gosh, it's just great to see you guys. Like some of the same manner is like, it's weird, you know, mm -hmm. like we were obviously not raised together, but it's, it's, I love that sort of, it's a revelation for me really is seeing all those things. And it does help you feel like you, where you fit in the world. Yeah. Right. I mean, it, it's hard to explain uh, for, you know, when somebody hasn't been adopted, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to explain it, but I often joke about the story when my parents were, had adopted me and we would be in town and they would run across friends that they hadn't seen, you know, in several years. And they, oh, this is our son, Kendall. And people almost always, oh my gosh, yeah, I see the similarity, you know, and even as a toddler, I was just a smart ass and I'd be like, oh, that's cute and sweet. That's not real. Cause I don't look anything like these people. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and, and it, you know, and they'd all get a kick out of it because my mother would be like, Oh, I should have mentioned, you know, he's adopted and he's very vocal about it. None of us looked alike. Like my mother didn't look like my father or my father. I didn't look like either of them. We just were this cute little hodgepodge family, you know, yeah. stuck together, but it was fantastic. So, but that's, I think people um, wanting to see you as, as part of a whole, you know, so it's like, a, a, yep. I know I've done that with friends who have adopted siblings or something where I'm like, oh yeah. And then you know, they're like, no, we're not relate we're not biologically related exactly. um but you do have a desire to like kind of find like what what it, you know let me find the thing that that ties them together and i i would always enjoy it yeah. like it was a it was funny but b later my mother would tell me like that it really meant a lot to you to me as a, as the child to say you know i know it was bogus like i know people were just trying to be inclusive but i loved that that people wanted me to fit into that family you know what yeah. i mean my mom would be like well you don't look like me but that's okay right. you know <laughs> like it's it's okay you know yeah and i hear now so many people's stories of people who were adopted and how their families in my opinion did not handle things right yeah. and i am so so fortunate that i feel like my parents did almost everything right i think from the fact that i don't ever remember not knowing that i was adopted you know what i mean like yeah. it, just from the time i was born and i mean they couldn't have hidden it i mean we lived in a town that was about as big as the room i'm sitting in <laughs> everybody knew everybody's business i would have found out in you know three minutes when i could start hearing stories i give them so much credit and it's funny i always have this affinity for them of course i love them but i never knew what a great job they did until I start comparing my story to other people's stories. Sure. It's like, Oh my God. You know, like your parents were at all. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's what I'm thinking, you know, yeah. like I would never say it, but it's like, wow. You know, like, yeah. Or, or, you know, the, the poor people who have been lied to all their lives, right. you know, like, like the father is not biological father and you know they don't they've always known and kept these secrets and for Corey and me it's really about not having these you know let's just convince everybody not to have these secrets you yeah. know just remove the shame you know and uh yeah let the people embrace their themselves you know yeah. which I can only hope for your brother you know I hope so I think I I'm heartened to that I think almost everyone does it better now with adoption mm -hmm. um, that there's the kind of mainstream just like teaching around it has gotten so much better. So parents aren't on their own left to kind of like 
figure out what the best move is. And there seems to be a kind of like unanimous understanding of how to handle that particular situation anyway. Yeah, I, I hope things get to a place where we find some kind of new balance. I think the when I wrote the book too, all, everything I write is about siblings and sisters. Those relationships have been like the bedrock of my entire life. My dad died when I was in high school and then my mom um, had just a long period of addiction where she was kind of... So my sisters mm-hmm. and I were really each other's whole family for years. When I think, you know, about what Ryan went through, not just with my dad, but also not having any of that, mm-hmm. knowing that potentially you do have these siblings somewhere and the, the kind of promise of that, I hope we're able to find a new way of operating because that has been just such a gift. I, I think the reason I'm drawn to it so much in fiction is those relationships are so different than any other relationship you have. Like they just are built on this combination of like genetic similarity and just kind of this weird intuitive understanding of one another uh, and also the shared history. So I think part of the book too was thinking about, well, like what would a sibling relationship look like when you don't have that shared history piece, you only have the genetic similarity piece. And I'm curious about that myself. You know, Ryan, when we were talking, he was sending me pictures of him as a baby and he asked for pictures of me as a baby and he's looking for for those things. I still don't really know how different that relationship would be on the day to day if we hung out in person and how, right. how it would feel different than like my relationship with say my sister, which is its own thing or my other sister, which is also yeah. different. You know, they're different yeah. even between them, but um, yeah, I'm curious about it. I think that like nature nurture piece is um, fascinating. For sure. For sure. And I feel so fortunate. My sister, Stephanie, just recently, we live about 80 miles from Boston and uh, my sister just took a traveling nurse position in Boston. So she is, temporarily here or close it last weekend her husband and son were here we got to have dim sum with them and this coming weekend she's going to come and spend the weekend with Corey and me there's no way to make up for 47 years without you know the siblings but every moment i get to spend with them is just precious That's you know nice. it's it's fantastic and you know i always knew when I love somebody, I love them a lot, you know? So like, I knew that when I, when I got connected to these people, I was going to, you know, be all in and I am, I wear my heart on my sleeve and I, you know, I could be damaged really quickly by people because I, you know, I'm just, um, silly enough to say, you know, everybody's great, especially at the beginning. Right. And, uh, it really has been great. I mean, I'm so, so fortunate to have the, the siblings that I have. And, and at least my father, I don't know much about my mother, but my dad is just great and uh, very different than my adoptive uh, parents, but just a free spirit guy. And he, I, we just laugh the whole time we're together. So it's just fantastic. But you made me think of something when you were talking about the way that things have changed. It's funny, I hadn't thought about this in a long time, but even when my parents were considering adoption and they were dealing with their attorney and right, even right before, you know, they got custody of me, which took a long time. I mean, they started the process like six years before they got me. It's just crazy. And I was only two months. So obviously it wasn't necessarily that they were trying to get me, but you know, if they were trying to get a baby and even their attorney, who was their really good friend, he was like, do you, you know, how are you going to handle this? There was enough stigma still around adoption that he was like, are you guys going to move away so that you can raise Kendall, you know, secretly as yours? And they're like, uh, no, you know what I mean? Like, again, that just kind of speaks to who they were because they were apparently getting a lot of advice like that, like from people that didn't want them to move away. It's like, but, you know, they thought that would be socially appropriate. You know, it's like, and you just have to know my parents. They'd be like, 
really shut up and go live your lives. We're going to do our thing. You know what I mean? Like we're going to, we're going to have this kid and we're going to, and you're going to like it and you're going to shut up if you don't. It just makes me happy because what if they had taken that advice? Then maybe I never would have known I was adopted. You know, then it would have been a big surprise in 17. Again, they handled things so well. I remember even the attorney telling me when I was a teenager, I told your parents they shouldn't, you know, I was like, you know what? Screw you. You know, I was like, thanks. I'm glad they didn't listen. <laughs> yeah. You know, I guess you charged them for that great <laughs> advice uh, too. But um, yeah, that's just, yeah. Well, uh, are you doing uh, a lot of publicity for the book? Yeah, we've been doing like a little bit of a book tour. So I was in New York for the first week of January. We did, you know, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and then yeah. um, came back to LA, did an event in LA. I have a little bit of downtime now and then some more dates in February. So it's been really fun. The essay writing part of it is is done. The, the publication of the book sort of forced me to write all of these essays because that is how I process things. Like I just think better mm -hmm. when I'm able to write about them. Publishing that piece in The Guardian and then I published a personal essay in The Times about my mom and both of those have just led to this outpouring of people's stories and support. It has been lovely to hear from everybody. And I feel a little silly that like I've been living all these years thinking that we were doing things so strangely. And, um, and then to hear from all these other families who've been through similar things has been really nice. So unexpected part of book publicity has been connecting, not just with readers, but with people who resonate with my story in some way. And I hope we'll also see those pieces in the book. Those are just kind of my obsessions in fiction too. It was family and grief right. and addiction and things like that. Mm -hmm. Well, I always say that we can't hear enough of these stories. And I love the, the, the slant that you're taking with the fiction. You obviously, when we're speaking to people on the podcast, we're talking about their real lives, but I'm really intrigued about how, you know, similar uh, fictional characters uh, situations can be to ours. And we'd like to connect again to see if something changes in your own story, yeah. you know, where maybe there's some shift. It sounds like you guys are already on a great path, in my opinion, but, you know, it's it's always unfolding, right? Always, <laughs> always changing. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Well, thanks so much for spending time with me today. Wow. I know I'm a bit biased, but I was so surprised and touched by Kendall's and Kate's conversation. But I shouldn't be surprised that Kate's answers to his questions prompted parallels in their lives. While Kate's is not an adoption story, there are many similarities in how Kendall and Kate and some of our other guests feel about family secrets. Thank you, Kendall, for taking the reins this episode. Season 5 launches next week, and we've got lots of twisty tales to share via our awesome and brave guests. If you've enjoyed this episode, don't keep it to yourself. Share it with a friend. And if you really like this episode, we'd love to hear about it in the form of a review or email. Our links are in the show notes. Thank you for doing the twist with us. The Family Twist podcast features original music by Cosmic Afterthoughts and is presented by Savoir Faire Marketing Communications, 